Good morning, everyone. Great to see you today, this beautiful, beautiful fall day. By the way, that noise you hear is the Cubs fans celebrating. Yeah. Back in the 50s and 60s, that's when I followed baseball and I knew all the players. I knew the numbers on their back. I knew a lot of their batting averages, but I, I don't follow baseball that closely anymore until this time of the year. And uh, wow, this is going to be a fun World Series. And uh, if you're a Cubs fan uh, like I am, I think you're, you're pretty excited about this. It's been quite a weekend. We've had the, the baseball game and uh, then man's camp. Um, can you imagine the snoring <laughs> at man's camp? I, I've been told it registered 4.5 on the Richter scale. <laughs> so I think I've got a tough assignment ahead of me this morning, keeping you out of sleepy land today, but I'm going to do my best. Somebody said or actually suggested and expressed that uh, I hope it's a short sermon. I'm hungry. And I reassured them and said, I'm hungry too. So let's get started. By turning in our Bibles, Pastor Jeff got us out, uh, off to a great start last week as we have begun a series on, from the book of James. So we are looking in the first chapter of James today. And we're going to begin reading with James chapter 1, uh, uh, verse 19 through verse 25. James chapter 1, verse 19. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the Word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Verse 25, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Now, when Pastor first suggested that we do a series of sermons through the book of James, I have to confess that my heart sank just a little. You see, I, I remember preaching a, a series of sermons through the book of James way back in 1975, and I was underwhelmed by the sermons I preached. There wasn't one of them I'd want to preach again. There wasn't one of them you'd want to hear me preach again. The book of James is a challenge for me to follow. He doesn't write like I think in a linear fashion. He, he tends to jump around. He goes from one thought to another. He's here, and then he's there, and then it seems like he get, goes there before he has gotten finished over here. I read James and I say, what does verse 21 have to do with verse 20? What does verse 27 have to do with verse 26? So, pastor, you could have picked any book. You could have put, picked Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, but you had to pick James. I think he did that because that's his name. Why couldn't his parents have named him Luke or Ezekiel or Nehemiah or Ecclesiastes or Exodus? But truthfully, the book of James will provide us with much valuable information and inspiration. 
It is a reservoir of riches waiting to be mined, waiting to be mine. Throughout Judea and Samaria. So James is writing to these scattered Jews, these scattered Christians. When he gets to verse 19, he adds these words of affection. He calls them, my dear brothers. Not just brothers. Not just my brothers. My dear brothers. Those I cherish. Those who are so precious to me. Those who are part of the family. Now, who is this James? Where does he come from? What's his story? What's his heart? He is a Jew writing to Jews, but he is a Christian writing to Christians. The fact is, Jesus was James' half-brother. They had the same mother. But James prefers the title that he gives us at the beginning of this epistle. He doesn't say James, a brother of Jesus. He says James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul documents a number of post-resurrection appearances by the living Christ, and he gives us a list of individuals and groups. Then he tops it off by saying, and he appeared to James. James had not always been a follower, not always a, a, a servant of Jesus. But after the resurrected Christ appeared to him, James fully endorses him and ascribes to him the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I had another issue with James. I confess that in my early ministry, I had just a little bias against James. I, I wouldn't say that he was my favorite. I, I didn't warm up and welcome him as fully as I had Peter and Paul and, and John. I saw him more Jewish in theology and more law-minded than Paul. I, I much preferred Paul's all-or-nothing grace. But really, a closer look shows there is no disagreement between James and Paul. Both are heralds of truth and grace. Now, Paul writes more, a lot more, in fact, so we get more grace from Paul. But James, though he challenges us in this realm of our conduct, our speech, and our deeds, he too reminds us in chapter 1 that God is good and He gives good gifts. And he reminds us in chapter 4 and verse 6, God gives grace to the humble. He reminds us in chapter 5 and verse 11, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So I, I was wrong. I was wrong about James. And when I get to heaven, I will apologize to him in person and a whole lot of other people as well. But that's another story. We can see by his language that James is not a harsh, stern lawgiver. He's not a New Testament Moses. He's not a Sinai saint. He is a man of great care and concern, and even the hard things he has to say are wrapped in the cloak of compassion, and they come from the heart of a good and merciful God. So the first thing I want to take note of is James' relationship with the church. Secondly, the second thing is, let's note James' rules for the church. James gives us three rules here. And they're very simple, and yet we stumble all over them. They are very valuable, and if we would abide by these three simple rules, I'm convinced we'd have better relationships all the way around. We'd have better marriages, better friendships, better churches, better government. Now, here they are, three simple rules. James gives them to us. Write them down if you dare. The first one, he says, in verse 19, is be quick to listen. Be quick to listen. Do you know any good listeners? It's a rarity, isn't it? Think about it. 
You know, over the years, I've probably been told that I'm a good speaker a few times, but I have, I, I've only been told I was a good listener maybe once or twice. Yes, that hurts. That hurts. Pastor, author, and professor Eugene Peterson gave us the poetic paraphrase of the message. Some of you carry that Bible with you this morning. As a pastor, he felt pulled in a thousand directions. I wonder why. And he finally figured out where he belonged as a pastor, what he wanted his pastorship to look like. He figured out what kind of pastor he wanted to be and what his calling was and where his gifts could and should take him. And he, he brought it down to three simple duties. I love the simplicity of it. And there is power and freedom in simplicity. Simple but well thought out and with deep personal conviction. He concluded this is the way he wanted to conduct his pastoral life. Number one, to pray. Number two, to preach. And then the third one caught me by surprise. Number three, to listen. He saw this as his ministry to his people, to value them enough to close his mouth and open his ears, to listen, really listen, not just with his ears, but with a fully committed pastor's heart. It made me wish I could go back and do it a little differently. Now, Pastor Jeff has the gift of being a good listener. What a pastoral gift. I'll just be honest, he's the best listener on our pastoral staff. So if you need to talk to someone, you go to him. Yeah, he's the guy, and his cell number is, <laughs> now you're nervous. You're really nervous right now. Well, it's a good word for all of us, pastor or not. Be quick to listen. That's a lot more biblical and a lot more needed in today's world than most of us think. Don't you think there's a reason God gave us one mouth and two ears, and yet most of us talk twice as much as we listen. Be quick to listen. And then coupled with that, James says in verse 19, be slow to speak. That's hard. I got a quick wit, and that's a hard one for me. I was being interviewed by our board one time, and they asked the all too predictable question, what do you think is one of your strengths? And I said, well, I think my humor. Next question, what do you think is one of your weaknesses? Well, I think my humor. <laughs> because that quick wit can get you into trouble. Think of the heartaches that could be avoided if this one rule was observed, be slow to speak. Because once a word is spoken, uh-uh, too late. Heaven and earth cannot bring it back. So choose your words carefully. Proverbs talk a lot about that. It says things like, he that refraineth his lips is wise, and he that hath knowledge spareth his words. Slow to speak. But hey, man, I've got so much to say. Yeah, I know, slow to speak. But I'm the smartest man in the room slow to speak. But the world needs my expertise, <laughs> slow to speak. But no, slow to speak. Don't know about you, but I've got a homework assignment to work on. And then he says, thirdly, in verse 19, be slow to become angry. So go ahead and get that up there before I get angry. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> now think about that. What a combination. If you are quick to talk and quick to anger, 
You're a walking stick of dynamite, and nobody really enjoys being around you. A quick tongue and a quick temper are a dangerous combination. Paul, James, talk about anger quite a bit. Anger is powerful and toxic and dangerous. Anger hurts the vessel that holds it as well as the one upon whom it is poured. And the more we learn about anger and what it does to the bodily systems, the more we learn how poisonous and perilous anger is. Anger releases powerful and destructive toxins in the human body. Physiologists, well-known physiologists, years ago, John Hunter knew what anger could do. In fact, he said, the first scoundrel that makes me angry is going to kill me. Sometime later at a medical meeting, a speaker made assertions that incensed Hunter. He stood up to rail against the speaker, and he died on the spot with a heart attack, taken out by anger. I just read a report a few days ago, this past week, I think it was, on, on, or heard one on the news, that said anger doubles your chances of a heart attack. And anger, while exercising, triples your chances of a heart attack. A couple of days after reading that and hearing it, I, uh, I got angry at computers. Computers! Not just computer, all computers! I was in my office trying, and I couldn't get access to my documents, and I got angry at my computer, and I couldn't get anywhere. If I can't get access to my documents, I'm done. So I went home and got on my computer at home. And right in the middle of working on this sermon, uh, right about this point in the sermon, my computer stopped, and it went through some process without my permission. So I said, you know, let's do something constructive. We can't get anywhere with this. And I'm fuming. I'm angry at computers. And so I said, let's go downstairs and exercise. And then I just remembered what I'd studied. <laughs> Anger and exercise triple your chance for a heart attack. So I stopped midway, halfway up the stairs, down the stairs, and I'm saying, what do I do here? Do I, do I try it or not? Finally, I said, let's go for it. Try to rein in your anger. Take my cell phone down with me. If I feel any pains around my chest, <laughs> I'll call my wife. But there's a lesson to be learned. Slow to anger. Slow to anger and quick to get over it. We have James' relationship, and then we have James' rules but then thirdly, take note of James' reminder to the church. He reminds them of something very basic, very essential in their Christian experience. He reminds them of the power of the Word. And the power of that Word is seen in our spiritual birth. Think about it. You have been delivered. You have been rescued out of a kingdom of darkness, brought into a kingdom of glorious light. You have been snatched from bondage, and you have been brought into a kingdom of glorious freedom. You've been taken out of a kingdom of, that is really that ugly and that horrible into a kingdom that is so full of glory and promise. Look at verse 18, James says, he chose to give us birth, a new birth, new life, new creations through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Wow. We have been born again. We have been made new creations. We have been regenerated by the power of God's word and God's spirit working in harmony and unity in our lives. 
We've been given new life, eternal life, through the powerful seed of God's Word. Peter talks the same way in chapter 1 of 1 Peter. He says, for you have been born again, not a perishable seed, but through the living and endurable Word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the Word of the Lord stands forever. So, my friend, this is where it's at right here. Look no further. This is where the hope is. This is where the truth is. This is where the answer is. Man doesn't have the right answers. He doesn't even know the right questions. The answers are found in God's Word. And I'll tell you, if this church ever stops loving and preaching the Word of God, you won't see me here. I'm gone. And if I ever stop loving and preaching God's Word, do yourself a favor and fire me. We owe everything to God's Word. By that word, we were born again. Not only were we born again, but also the power of God's Word is seen in our uh, our eternal salvation in verse 21. James says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the Word planted in you which can save you. That's the power of God's Word, not only were we, by God's Word, born again, but we are born along by the saving, keeping power of God's Word. Not only did God's Word get you started in the kingdom, it's going to take you to the finish line in the kingdom. Paul told the Ephesian believers, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of of your salvation. He said to the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. So the word that saved us is the word that saves us. This ongoing, continual action. So James reminds us of the power of the word, but then he also reminds us of the purity of the purity of the Word. In verse 18, again, he says, and what is God's Word called there? It's called the Word of Truth. The Word of Truth. I like that. It's truth. That's what it's about. Give me the truth. Nothing but the truth. It's amazing to me where truth is not found. Not found in places where you would think or at least hope truth would be found. So often, not found in the classroom, not found in the boardroom, not found in the schoolhouse, the church house, or the White House, rarely flowing from the lips of a politician. Instead, we get lies, cover-ups, misrepresentations, and exaggerations. What is truth, and where is truth? Both questions are answered right here in this book, the Word of Truth. And then James presents to us the prominence of the Word. The prominence and preeminence of the Word is shown, and James gives three very carefully selected words in regard to our response to the truth of God's Word. The first one is in verse 21. And it's that word, accept. Therefore, he says at the end of the sentence, humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. That's a key word. That's a big word. In the Greek, and I don't think we, in our English, as we superficially read these words, can really fully appreciate the depth of the meaning of that word. That word accept, it's a really big word. In the Greek, it meant to give a grandiose welcome, to show hospitality toward, to open one's heart and home, to lovingly and joyfully and fully embrace 
the gospel. And it all starts with what? James says, humility. Humbly accept the word because proud people, self-sufficient people, self-righteous people cannot accept the word because they see no need for it. That's why pride will keep you out of the kingdom. That's why James later says, and Peter echoes identically and says, God resisteth the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Accept, and then the second word He uses in our relationship to the Word and acknowledging its preeminence is in verse 22, and that's the word listen. But He cautions, don't think listening is enough. Listen with your heart. Listen with your volition, your will. Listen with your emotions. Two times in this brief passage, James issues a warning about deception, and every single one of us are to live in fear of being deceived. In these last days, there is a spirit of delusion that's been released upon our world. Even the elect are being deceived. And one realm of being deceived has to do with our speaking. James says in verse 26, and the other with our listening in verse 22. You see, we don't even need external assistance in being deceived. We're good by ourselves. We can deceive ourselves. And if we think listening is enough, James says we deceive ourselves. Listen to God's Word, but don't stop with just listening. He says, do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. We listen, but then we must move on to obeying, and that is captured in that little word there, do. You see that in verse 23. In fact, you'll see it a form of it five times in the text we've read this morning. Has there ever been a bigger little word than do? There are lots of hearers, but not too many doers. There are a lot of forgetters, not so many followers. James is saying you want God's blessing in your life. You've got to do more than listen to God's Word. You've got to live it. You've got to put it into practice. You see... A person's relationship with the Word of God reveals that person's relationship with God. I think that's terribly important. I'm going I'm to say it again. A person's relationship with the Word of God reveals that person's relationship with God. I had a youth pastor who one time who was a great, great person, really a pastor's dream for a staff member. He, he worked with me for several years, and I, I never had a cross word with him except one time. I had asked him to do something, and he wrote it off. He dismissed it. He went about his business. He forgot it, whatever. So we had a talk, and I explained that if I asked him to do something, I asked him to do it because it was important. I asked him to do it with good reason, that it was important to me, and if it was important to me, it should be important to him. And if you dismiss and discount my words, you have, you have done the same to me. And we never had a never had another problem. Let me ask you, can we say we love God if we don't love His Word? Can we say we are close to God if His Word is at hand but never in hand? Can we say we know God if we don't know His Word? So you can see why James is so troubling for me. His words are rather unsettling. 
His words issue a call. I think a call for every one of us to be transparent before the Lord and to see our own shortcomings and to ask God to come and help us. James' relationship with the church, James' rules for the church, James' reminders to the church. James speaks to us. Thank God for him. And behind James, the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Let's listen, really listen, to the point that our listening becomes our living. I'm going to lead us in a prayer of consecration. Our worship team is going to come, and they'll lead us afterwards in a song of consecration. Perhaps you'd like to stand with me as we make ourselves bare and available to the Lord this morning. Father, Your Word is a good Word. It heals, it mends, and yet it cuts, and it challenges, and it goes after those areas in our lives, in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our speech, in our conduct that are outside the realm of Your will, that offend You. And we thank You today that James speaks so precisely and so pointedly, and he speaks right where we live. And so, Father, we don't run, we don't hide, we don't push aside Your Word and Your revelation, but we want to face it. And we say, Lord, it exposes us, it shows us as flawed and failing human beings who are always in the need of Your mercy, who are always in the need of the power of Your Word being operative in our lives. So our prayer today is very simple, Lord. Please come to us and let Spirit and Word do what man's will and effort could never do alone. Let Your Spirit and Your Word bring life and renewal and power to our Christian life, our, our very Christian testimony. Lord, we make ourselves available to You. We don't cover up. We don't run and hide. We surrender. Here we are, Lord. We surrender.